Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Art Blocks After Dinner Mint series titled Behind the Code. On the show, we welcome Art Blocks artists to share a deeper look into their project's creative coding and process. Today, we welcome Ryan Green, who joins us to speak about his project, The Colors That Heal. It's a very special project in partnership with Endowment and Sustento, where half of the proceeds directly support programs that reduce burnout among frontline healthcare workers. At the time of this recording, it is open for Mint, and the project link can be found in the video's description. As always, at the end of the show, we'll open the floor to questions that have been asked on the live YouTube page or Discord. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Um, well, hey, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Colors That Heal, uh, why I did the project, some of the inspiration behind the project, um, how my life experience has influenced this, <laughs> and then we'll like dig deeper into the code. Um, if anybody, uh, I'm going to stay kind of high level, but if at the end anybody has any more specific questions, um, then I'd be happy to answer them. So let's dig in. Okay. So um, last year, last fall, um, I was asked, um, or I was, I was, given an opportunity to apply for a partnership with Endowment and Sustento. They're starting a new platform um, that's focused on charitable giving. And in the first place that um, looked like it would be a good match for me was this partnership with Sustento. Um, and they work with healthcare workers. And so for me, healthcare has always been something that's um, like close to home because I spent the first 10 years of my career as a, as a web application developer at a, at a large dialysis firm. Um, and so I spent a lot of time just making apps in with web technologies. <clears throat> and then uh, in 2000, let's see, 2010, my third son, Joel, got sick um, with cancer. And, um, and so that kind of ushered in this whole new period of my life after 30 of, um, of that process of walking through terminal cancer. And then how I processed it personally and how I processed it, processed it creatively. And, um, and when thinking about that intersection of healthcare and life experience, this image came to mind. Um, this is a concept image from a video game that my wife and I and my business partner, Josh, and my friends um, made together called That Dragon Cancer. And it was released back in 2016. And this concept image is uh, me. It, it depicts me <laughs> uh, in my typical uniform, which is flip-flops and cargo shorts, like any good dad. And, um, and my son, Joel, um, early on in the cancer treatment. Um, and there's an interesting thing about hospitals, especially children's hospitals, is that they're always like brightly colored and beautiful and they're full of art. But in the midst of all of this beauty, you know, uh, there's there's me, my son Joel, and a uh, hundred other people and their children um, all going through their individual battles. And so there's this um, there's this um, juxtaposition of beauty and pain. And that is where I start now um, after going through this. Uh, when approaching anything related to like the healthcare space. Um, also, throughout this experience, a lot of times in my art, um, uh, I look for metaphorical ways to represent things. And so in that dragon cancer, always at the edges of each scene, we try to make it as sun-soaked and light-soaked and beautiful as possible, but always at the edges of the scene was kind of the encroachment of... Um, of these masses. Um, and I kind of imagine tumor as like this, you know, tree that keeps growing um, and gets all tangled. Um, and there's a certain beauty to it, but there's also a certain ominous presence there. And this was um, a dream sequence in the game where Joel is floating, um, tethered by uh, hand, uh, <laughs> rubber balloons that we um, we would blow up the, we would blow up the gloves in the hospital and, um, 
and make them balloons and play with them. And so he's tethered to this collection of balloons. And um, the these asteroids of cancer are coming at him and we're trying desperately to dodge them. As you can see here also, um, this is a, a concept drawing from, or render from around 2012 or 2013. Mm -hmm. When I'm first learning to do 3D art, it was really important to me to participate in the art process of this game. And so I just kind of went all in to 3D art. And, uh, and, you know, even in here, we're, you know, thinking about how, like, these, these trees, you know, in the corner of the room are, like, pressing up through the floors and kind of encroaching in this beautiful space. Um, so that was the 3D practice and in, in the in the video game practice. Um, I wanted to touch on really quick, like where I've been going with the, my generative art practice. And in my generative art practice, I'm really enamored with um, autonomous agents and uh, what are called voids or flocking behavior. Like if you've ever seen starlings um, in the sky flocking together in these murmurations, um, or fish, uh, schools of fish swimming around. I, I just find the movement mesmerizing. And um, in my first two art blocks projects, Beauty and the Herding and Flora, Fauna, Foscals, and Floods, um, explore that space of what would happen if you, if these little creatures were flying and flocking, but you traced their paths, you like traced their lifespan throughout their, um, for as long as they move and you associated how they moved with certain colors and um, you controlled their, their steering behaviors, what kind of beautiful patterns would emerge. And it's really a meditation on life um, about, you know, like what we as these flocking creatures on earth do during our, um, during our lives here and what we create. And so um, when approaching, uh, when approaching, I'm gonna go back here. <laughs> When approaching this partnership, um, I was really drawing from that experience, that life experience of spending time in the hospital and the art experience of really like thinking about us as these autonomous agents that are all moving together as we kind of um, circumnavigate this globe um, and live our lives. So um, last year, uh, mid last year, 2022, um, I was really taken by um by jeff palmer's work harmonium he released on fx hash last year and um, what i loved about this is this um i loved the circle packing or not circle packing line packing um and it wasn't really line packing it was more um it was a different type of algorithm but um it, it, akin to flow fields um where you have uh these lines that are approaching each other but they're never intersecting um, and they, they create these, um, beautiful tangled webs of lines. Um, and I was really taken by that. Also at the time, this is a project in, in progress for me. Um, I was experimenting with circle packing. I've always loved circle packing. I know it's like one of the first things that when you get into generative art, it's either like flow fields or circle packing, but I'm really taken with circle packing. Um, and so this is kind of the headspace I was in of, um, of wanting to explore that. So while I was waiting for flora, fauna, I was waiting for feedback on flora, fauna, false gods, and floods from art blocks. I was, I was working on this and I was also experimenting with line packing. And so in this, um, and so, you know, partly inspired by Jeff Palmer's work, partly inspired by things like Fidanza and just like how appealing <laughs> uh, these kind of flow fields are. Um, I started to combine, um, voids and, and the autonomous agent behavior that I've used in previous projects, but then applying them um, to a context where uh, lines can't cross or intersect, they just approach each other and stop. And so these were some experience back, experiments back in July um, before I started the endowment project in October. Um, and so this is, you know, some uh, prints from my sketchbook here. Um, 
in all of these scenarios, what I do is I would release these voids. Like if you imagine releasing a uh, flock, uh, school of fish <laughs> into water and giving them directions um, to swim and making sure that they never overlap each other, that they always approach each other, but that they're over, never overlapping. And then when they approach each other and do, uh, they when they dead end into each other, they die. And so that creates this kind of um, organic uh, collection of, um, of lines. And so what I was uh, experimenting with is like, how can I control this uh, flocking behavior in a more like structured way? Um, and how can I make it look organic? And um, in, you know, as you can see here from another concept uh, screenshot from the game, like I, I tend to circle around like sacred themes. Um, and uh, I, I found this, uh, this idea of stained glass and, um, and kind of the, the sacred nature of, you know, you know, mixing, you know, the organic with the, the you know, structured uh, to be really appealing. So, um, so where did I learn about autonomous agents? Well, I learned about them from uh, Daniel Schiffman. Um, this book has been really helpful in my processes, uh, both for game development as well as for generative art. And I highly recommend buying this book. It's free though, and um, you can you can buy the PDF. But um, I really recommend it. And autonomous agents, just to kind of get into it. Um, uh, are highlighted in this chapter. So we're going to take a look at this chapter. Um, so autonomous agents are, are uh, analogous to vehicles and steering. Like the idea is, is that you would have a vehicle and you want to steer it around the um, screen. And so you have your velocity and your desired velocity. And um, as your desired velocity exerts force on the vehicle, the vehicle turns. Uh, but it can't turn right away because it's already going in a direction. So you have to push it. Um, and when you push it, you start to get behavior like this, where as you're moving the target of their attraction around the screen, you start to get these really smooth lines or smooth uh, steering behavior. And so what you can do is you can control how hard um, you steer, like how hard, how much pressure that you exert. And you can also control uh, how stubborn the void is, uh, how quickly it is to turn around. And so there's different, uh, there's a seek steering behavior. There's also a rive steering behavior. And with a rive steering behavior, as they approach their target, they start to slow down. And so you'll see that um, as it approaches the target, rather than keep moving, it kind of slows to a stop. And so that is where I started with this um, exploration of, of what I was going to do with the endowment project with Colors That Heal. Um, and so um, to that end, let's see. All right, so we're gonna start in kind of this um, uncovering the code of Colors That Heal uh, with, um, with voids and SDFs. Okay, so void behavior is the steering behavior. And SDFs are, um, are what are called signed distance fields. <laughs> and I'll kind of get into the details of that. But basically, it's a way of controlling the boundaries of something where you can say, um, I want to make sure that the distance between uh, one point and another point is not greater than a specific diameter in the case of a circle. And so what you can do is that if the void goes beyond the boundaries, beyond the distance of a circle, then I can make sure it dies and that what's left is a, um, is a circle stencil. So I go into this code here and show you what, it ha what happens. So um, we're gonna start with dropping these voids on the screen. And they're going to steer in random directions, um, but they're going every which way. And you can see they become a tangled mess pretty quickly. And that's because I haven't allowed them, or because I've allowed them to intersect. And so as you see them play out over time, um, 
it's interesting, but not very appealing. And so one thing I was experimenting with circle packing or with line packing is how many lines can I put in a single space without having them overlap? So So in this case, what I do is I'm not controlling where they go. I'm just controlling whether or not they intersect. Now I can set the distance of how far they can be apart right now. They can't be closer than 15 pixels, but if I change that to like five pixels, then you'll see you're starting to get a much tighter packed space. And so all I'm doing is that as I'm pushing these vehicles around, <laughs> around the page um, and drawing a line every time they move, I'm also looking ahead and I'm saying, okay, um, is there anything in their way? And if there's anything in their way, I'm going to check how far of a distance um, they are from something else. And, um, and then if they're closer than five pixels, then I'll just uh, kill the void and it will stop. Um, or if it's not, I will, I will continue to steer it away, uh, perhaps from like an approaching object. And so as we, uh, so right now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm steering them in a wandering direction. I can also steer them in, um, in the same direction. So if I want to steer them all going down, then every time they generate, you see they all go down. I can also steer them in, let's see, I can steer them in the right direction. So to steer them in the right direction, every frame, I push them right. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> okay. So what I started to do is I started to combine this idea of sign distance fields of um, controlling how far they can go and what their boundaries were and different um, steering behavior to start to create some interesting shapes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on sign distance function. And what this is going to do is it's going to test if the void is further away than about 200 pixels from the center of this circle. So what you start to see as it fills in is it starts to follow a stencil. Um, and then what I can do is say I add another one. And this time, instead of the center being 200 pixels to the right of center of the page, I'm going to do 200 pixels to the left of center of this page. And instead of right, I'm going to do seek wander. And now... Um, there we go. And now as I randomly put voids on the screen and I give them a direction um, and I tell them don't overlap and I say don't get outside of the circle, you start to see a pattern emerge. So I'm going to turn this up. I'm going to do 200, do 200 frames. We'll fill in real quick. So this comes with some drawbacks. You can see that like, as I'm randomly picking a point to spawn from, um, they, you know, there might be some un incomplete fields, or I'm sorry, incomplete edges. But the longer I keep going, the more random numbers I pick, eventually um, the space fills in. And you can see you get a much different effect from when like they're really close together versus when they're far apart. Like if I were to go back to 15 pixels, Um, we can see it's much less dense and it gives a much different feel. But what I liked about this is that it felt, again, it felt very organic. And as you know, with like my previous experience, I'm always looking for like the, the organic mixed with the structured and kind of where they collide. Um, kind of like 
uh, <laughs> medicine, how you know we're we're dealing with DNA and we're dealing with um, disease and we're dealing with all those things, but then we're we're trying to put constraints around it. Okay, so that said, go a little bit faster here. Um, so, as you you know, if you imagine trying to, um, I'm, I'm drawing lines on the screen and I need to keep track of like where the lines have been and where they haven't been. And if you imagine a screen as being like, uh, you know, a thousand pixels wide by a thousand pixels high, like that's a million pixels to track. Um, and it's much bigger with like these HD screens. You're talking about 2000 or you know, almost 2000 pixels by a thousand pixels for an HD screen. And it, it starts to multiply by four every time you double the width and height of the screen. So that's a lot of pixels. And if I were to try to detect if, um, if lines were intersecting and I was trying to do that, like every frame, I would have to loop over, you know, a million different positions and check if, if um, a line has been drawn on that space. Um, and that's really intensive. And, and part of the thing with animated art is that you don't want to do things that take the, the CPU, uh, the computer brain, or, the G, um, or even the GPU, which is like the graphics brain. And uh, you don't want to give it too much work to do every second because you want these animations to run smoothly. And to run smoothly, you have to be able to draw the screen about you know, 24 or 30 frames a second to get smooth animation. And so part of the things that uh, I you know, implemented in this code is that as I was starting to draw these shapes, I needed to make sure that I could detect where the line has been um, really quickly. And to do that, I used something called quad trees. And what quad trees are is they're a data structure um, and they hold uh, data in a very uh, structured way so that it makes looking up data much easier. So you know, if you were to imagine a dot being drawn on the screen, um, you put it at a certain position, and then um, you split the screen into quads, um, into quadrants, and you document that that dot was in the top left quadrant. Um, and then when you add another dot to the screen, you can imagine these voids being dropped on the screen, then uh, you would have to split it into quadrants again. So this top one gets split into four more. And then when I added another dot, then this bottom quadrant got split into four more. And then um, when I added the last dot, I didn't have to split it anymore. But now I have, um, you know, a lot of pixels. But I know the the boundaries of where these pixels are. Um, I know that there's only one void in this quadrant. I know there's two in this quadrant and one in this quadrant. And so I know that I don't have to look at the rest of the screen uh, to be able to know if I've drawn a line there. Um, and that's important because then instead of looking up a million or more positions on the screen, I only have to look up uh, one or two <laughs> in this in this scenario. So as an example, we'll go down here into quad trees and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So before we were dropping those quads on the screen and we were um, chasing them around the canvas. and um, And now as we do that, we start to draw a, um, a quad tree. So I'm going to turn this down a little bit. OK. Oh, a little bit further? No, let's do, let's do less than that. Let's do like 10. I want it to stop sooner. There we go. OK. So as you can see, as, I, um, as these uh, voids trace their path through the canvas, there are certain quadrants that they intersect and others that they don't. So I know that um, in this quadrant, there are no, um, the, no void has been here. Um, in these bottom two uh, boxes, no void has been here. So as I have a boy traveling around the screen, I don't have to check everywhere. I just have to check in its most uh, localized quadrant. So if I was tracking, I don't know if you can see my cursor, hopefully, hopefully you can. But if I was tracking uh, one of these lines and I wanted to see, hey, is there any, is, are there any um, intersections I need to be worried about? Are there any points I need to be worried about? I only have to look in this area of the screen to know if there are. Um, and so this makes uh, looking up and, and detecting um, intersections on a screen very efficient. And uh, at the end, if you have more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. 
So um, the next thing, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, to expand on this aesthetic um, of just lines. And I thought about, you know, one of the things I love is, is lines with, uh, pen and ink lines with watercolor. Um, and so I started to experiment with like, what would it look like to give kind of a watercolor brush look or a painterly brush look under these lines? Um, and uh, actually my sister, uh, she uh, is kind of a master of the style. Um, she does a lot of hand-drawn note cards and such, and I, I really find it beautiful. And so I was mixing uh, kind of these uh, pattern of non-intersecting lines with um, a watercolor feel. And so to do that, We have the voids traveling, and, and um, in this case, I have them intersecting because I wanted it to look kind of organic, like branches. Um, and I start drawing um, shapes underneath it. And so when, um, you know, since we don't have, you know, brushes when we're using JavaScript, a lot of times um, generative artists will use really transparent polygons. Um, and so they are, uh, let's see, they're drawing a shape. Okay, so what, what's happening is that every time I move a void, I am both drawing a shape and then I am drawing a line. Um, and so I have a background layer for drawing the shape and I have a foreground layer for drawing the line. And when I draw a shape, um, let's see. <laughs> I, here we go. Okay. Um, so what I do is I start from the point on the screen that the void is at, and then I draw a circle around it. And I draw that circle by, if you, if you all remember your high school trigonometry, um, by tracing uh, or by, by setting the angle from zero to 360 degrees, or in my case, I'm using radians. So I'm saying zero to two pi. Um, that's how many radians are in a circle. And so by incrementing over um, all those radians, I, I trace a circle. Then the other thing I do is I use um, cosine and sine. And um, cosine and sine are the length of the adjacent leg and the opposite leg of a, tri of a right triangle. And so as I'm going around the circle, I'm using the, the point, um, you know, like say I was going from here. Um, you know, let's, let's draw on this. Come on. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to snapshot this. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so if I start here... Uh, Let's just, let's go, let's start right here. That's my center. And then I have a radius. Now I'm going in a full circle around it. Okay. So cosine of that angle represents this length times radius. And sine of an angle represents this length times a radius. And so as I go around, I can pick a point around the circle and I can um, draw a polygon that, that connects all those points. So if I were to connect all those points, you would see I have this. Well, if you imagine me drawing a lot of just regular polygons, um, it would start to look not very organic. And so what I do is instead of um, making it a consistent radius, we vary the radius by Perlin noise or like a random number. Um, and so what ends up happening is instead of a perfect circle, I'm going to go back. Where are we? Okay. Um, instead of a perfect circle, I can go around. And I want to say, like, this one is going to be this length. This one's going to be this length. This one's going to be this length. And if I connect all the dots, then I get a polygon that's irregular. Now, if I do that 100 times <laughs> and change the shape every time, you start to see the edges of the polygons disappear. And if I vary the color of the polygons, then they start to blend together in a really appealing way. So 
Um, that's kind of the basis technique of how I paint um, using JavaScript. So, um, so when uh, I was commissioned to do this project with endowment, um, one of the uh, you know I was I was already playing with lines and sine distance functions to control like shapes and make circles and squares and things like that. But I wanted to do something more complex. And so um, because this is a project that uses the Artblox um, Flex Engine, not everything in the project has to be on chain. Um, you can pull in resources off chain. And so one of the first things that I, I did to kind of experiment with this concept is I generated some healthcare images in black and white on Midjourney, um, which is an AI service that allows you to generate images based on a text prompt. And so I started experimenting with, okay, could I apply the style of lines and stencils using sign distance functions, but instead of using sign distance functions, maybe I could use a black and white image. And I could say, I want to use this pattern on this shade of black, and I want to use this pattern on this shade of black. And if I, um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of draw rough lines here. Oops. If I could roughly take the shade and say, this color of black gets straight lines and this color gets wavy lines. <laughs> then you can start to see how um, uh, putting those together could create a very um, organic and varied pattern. And so as I applied, I took these images in and I applied the style to them. I found them really appearing, uh, appealing. They were organic. And so when we're thinking about themes of like disease and burnout and healthcare overload and patient care and patient suffering and hope and all of those different things, um, if, it, you know, we mix kind of like the personification or not personification really, but like the, um, the aspect of making disease and, and medicine and all of these things kind of an organic thing. And then we uh, juxtapose that with like these emotional scenes um, that I found it to create really, um, a really warm and beautiful feel, but like kind of soaked in, in emotion. And so this was another prompt um, that I did in mid journey. And it's amazing that these comes out these way, this way. And you can say like black and white, you can say pen and ink, like you can give it a style. And then I just applied that style over it. And this was great. Like I was like, this is going to be really beautiful. I love this. But as I was thinking about like the Artblocks community and Artblocks um, and how they keep things on chain, I, I wanted to make sure that whatever I did, that the art stayed on the chain and that anything I added to it from um, off chain would only accentuate the piece, not destroy the piece. And so if like the, if the external sources uh, were to go away, then I wanted it still to be able to generate an image. And so in that way, I was thinking mid journey is really cool. However, am I going to produce hundreds of images and what happens if those images go away or if something goes wrong? Like, um, like I want to make sure that you can rebuild the piece on chain. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to be, I'm not going to be able to represent these representational organic forms that are highly detailed in um, JavaScript code. There's just like, it'd be too much code and, and it would be really complex. And so I started to think about, well, what if I went back to the shapes um, and went more abstract? And, you know, based on that, um, the work in that dragon cancer and these sun soaked hospital rooms, what was most appealing to me about that? And I started with the windows. And so I started to move in the direction of like, what would happen if I created um, a memory? Like if you think about to a traumatic time that you had in your past and how those memories um, come in fits and spurts and they blend together, they're not always in one place or one time and you remember things differently. I wanted to, to move in that direction with the windows. Um, and you know, it was really important to me that that is sun drenched and full of light and full of beauty, but also kind of juxtaposed with the ominous nature of of everything that you're facing when you're when you're dealing with healthcare. So instead of um, sign distance functions, I started to draw stencils. 
And a stencil would allow me, like I was saying with the mid journey to say, okay, this black area, I want to be this pattern. Uh, this light area, I want to be this pattern. And then interspersed between, I want to do like stripes of, of this pattern. And so uh, it started to create these really organic but abstract um, compositions. And I liked it. I really liked how it was going, but also it felt really abstract and I wanted people to, people to be able to, to connect with the piece in a personal way. And so um, I decided to go even more representational. Can see it filling in. All right, let's stop that. And so I went from very abstract sets of windows to drawing a room. And I used, you know, my skills from high school art class uh, to use a vanishing point. <laughs> and I started to draw, I would choose a vanishing point and I would start to draw walls and um, a floor and uh, windows of various shapes. And, uh, and once I generated that, go here. Um, you start to see that every time I generate it, it's a little bit different. And so it starts to give the feeling of a hospital room, but hospital rooms in, uh, in different locations. And so using this as a stencil, I could start to draw my boys on top of it. And um, once I did that, I started to get um, like organic feeling uh, watercolors uh, with like stencil or with inking on top of it. And it started to feel, I think, really beautiful and natural and started to approach the kind of feelings I was going for of, um, of organic shapes. Um, but I still felt like it was a little bit messy. Like I really love the organic nature of this, but it had a tendency to um, be kind of messy and have a lot of gaps. And I was feeling like um, I could stay organic or I could go a little bit even further and give myself some rules. And so I gave some myself some rules of composition. I, I decided to move away from um, kind of organic shapes and move back to um, uh, primitive shapes. So I give myself uh, permission to use cubes, um, rectangles, um, ellipses, circles, and triangles. And I wanted to, um, giving myself those rules, uh, explore what it would take to generate an emotive scene uh, with simple shapes. And so one of the things I started with was people. Um, I really wanted there to be a sense of people in these um, in these scenes, but um, I didn't want it to be kind of kitschy. I, I didn't want it to, I, I wanted it to fit into the style. Like, and so my first attempts kind of looked a little bit uncomfortably close to like Handmaid's Tale. Um, <laughs> so that's not the, really the message or, or feeling that I wanted to communicate. Um, but I wanted to communicate like an emotive feel with characters. Um, the same thing happened, or yeah. And so to that end, I decided to go fully abstract and um, and give myself even further rules. Like um, I'm, I'm going to stick to shapes, but I'm going to use tiling and I'm only going to allow myself squares and quarter circles. And what kind of pictures could I, what kind of feelings could I evoke um, using just those, those simple shapes? Um, and so again, I'm, I'm thinking about the past, I'm thinking about memory, how it all kind of blurs together, how what you remember is the silhouettes, you remember the reflections, you remember the shadows, but you don't necessarily remember everything that happened in the midst of trauma. So um, I started to experiment with like, could I, could I generate some known shapes? And then could I generate some noise and make it all fit together? Um, and so there, going on to figures, um, you can see I would start with um, known shapes. And if you imagine each one of these letters as um, either a square, uh, a quarter circle, rotated zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees, um, then uh, when I mash them all together in a grid, then they start to make 
um, certain known shapes. And then I added noise to it to really mess it up. And so you could see like, oh, one person with their arm out. Um, but you could also see elements of, of heads or shoulders or any of those things that kind of blend together. And so I really liked the feel of it. Um, I liked that it was that they were figures. I liked that um, they are patterns where you look for meaning in them, where you can kind of uh, discover or, or um, identify something that's familiar to you. And that based on these different figures, um, I could evoke different uh, like meditative or, um, or sadness or comfort or um, bedside manner or any of those things. Um, and so I, I started to head this direction rather than like the stick figure direction. One other thing um, in exploring this uh, that you know I started to add was, uh, along with you know trees, um, inspired by you know earlier work, is this idea of birds. And I went through a few iterations of birds. First, I started with just simple circles, and um, ovals, and then I added triangles for um, tails. And then I tried, okay, what could I, if I just drew birds with triangles, what kind of birds could I, what kind of feeling could I get with triangles? But I didn't feel like any of those really like matched the aesthetic that was starting to form. Um, and so I did the same thing with the birds that I had been doing with the flowers and with the people and with the windows and, and with the walls is I started to draw these simple shapes and then filled them in with lines. And so, um, yeah, you can see some of my earlier versions here, but um, I will skip down to birds. <laughs> and you can see as I kind of have the final compositions, I would trace out a bunch of beaks and then I would draw a stencil and I would just start squiggling, uh, scribbling inside the lines of those. Um, of those shapes and creating what felt far more organic and far more, far more in line with the style of the piece. And birds were, you know, an interesting touch for me because, um, you know, on the on the morning of my son's funeral, um, there were hundreds and hundreds of blackbirds in the trees. And on their own, blackbirds wouldn't really be ominous, but um, they felt ominous that day. And I felt like with the style of the Boyds and the flocking behavior, like it just felt right that birds should be in this piece. Um, because sometimes they can you mean beauty, sometimes they can be comfort, sometimes they can be ominous, sometimes they can trigger a memory. Um, and so that's why I included birds. Okay. Let's see one more. Gosh, we're at 11.45, so I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm down to um, the last couple slides here. Uh, one, one more little small point, when you're using random points to fill in a space, sometimes um, uh, a piece could look incomplete. And so what ended up happening is that as I would try to balance between kind of the randomness of filling in these stencils with patterns and, um, and the, the, uh, the the cleanness of the lines and the shapes. I wanted those really to read. I was finding that I I could render these um, drawings, but that they weren't filling in, um, which you know is a whole aesthetic, right? Like if I wanted to, it to look incomplete or more hand painted, like I could keep it like that. But the more I went in the direction of the shapes, the more I wanted the the lines to read and for people to be able to like pick out the elements. Um, uh, a little bit more clearly. And so to get away from that abstraction, I, I really wanted to be able to fill in the blanks. Well, when you're when you're uh, picking a random point of where to draw, and then you have further constraints of how close it can be to existing lines, there was a lot of space that just wasn't getting filled in. So one little trick I did was I went back to the quad trees and I said, okay, um, I know where all my points are, but by knowing where they all are, I also know where they're not. And so what I could do is I could say, um, in this quad tree, find a random rectangle with a width greater than a certain amount. So I said, find a random rectangle with a width greater than 10 and give me a point from within that, a random point within that rectangle. And so what I, the, what that allowed me to do is evenly distribute the random 
uh, points so that they filled in all the gaps in the canvas. And um, because of that, um, I started to get much more um, complete lines, much sharper lines, even when they're like really small shapes, like here in the windowsills. Um, and it cleaned, it, it was still the messiness of kind of that organic brush work I wanted to do, but then it also um, allowed me to do clean lines that read in the composition. So um, with that, <laughs> a few minutes left, um, I'm available for questions if you have any. Um, and if you want to hit me up on Twitter, there's my Twitter handle. If you're interested in what you saw here and want to see more mints, check out the mint site. You'll see uh, information about Sustento, about endowment, about what they're doing. You'll see all the existing mints um, and be able to browse those, browse those and maybe mint one for yourself. It goes to a good cause. Um, the Like uh, Pompey said, the proceeds are split 50-50 between me and the, um, and the charity. And uh, yeah, so thank you. That was great, Ryan. Um, it's uh, I don't know, going through the entire process and also touching upon so many different um, like techni technical components. I feel like this is going to be a, a very rewarding video for people uh, who are watching and also to return to um, in the future. Um, I think my first question is uh, as you were doing the void generation, mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of a video going around that I saw on social media of like it's a neuron or a brain cell or something that's like seeking a connection. So it's kind mm. of all, it's kind of like squirming in and yeah, cool. for the next one. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think of that. And um, you mentioned it here with Beauty and the Herding and for Fauna. Um, and there's this organic theme that, you know, runs through all of your uh, mm -hmm. creations. And I kind of just wanted to hear more about um, I don't know, the the trend of that in in your work and how, how you seek that out. And I think in in talking to other artists, it's such a difficult thing to <laughs> create organic mm -hmm. uh, structures and feelings and uh, mm -hmm. in works when um, I mean it's created through something that I guess is um, not alive, right? Your computer. So right, um, right. Yeah, I would love to hear just like more of your thoughts on that. What I love about um, algorithms, like life algorithms and things like that, is that um, you can apply very simple behaviors to these voids, but then as soon as you watch them uh, work, you start to assign meaning to it. And so even like, I'll just do a few of these random beauty and the hurtings. What I love about it is I have these little um, uh, pack of voids and I say like, hey, I need you to stay close together and I need you to seek like the average location of everybody like you. And so you have these packs of voids that are just kind of like switching directions and, and they start and, and then I have them chase the sheep and the sheep are the ones that are just kind of rolling around the globe. Um, and, you know, immediately you start to like root for the sheep or you start to root, root for the wolves um, because as you see them uh, do their thing, you start to assign, like, like I said, meaning to it. And so sometimes you'll watch these animations. I'd encourage you to go to the Beauty and the Hurting on Art Blocks and just watch some of these animations because some of them are really slow and methodical and some of them are really fast, but you'll notice sheep running away from the wolves. You'll notice like one sheep kind of peeling off and just being all by themselves. You'll see one that's just like making circles. And what I love about that is simple behavior creates narrative in our minds because we are creatures that look for patterns in the chaos. We need patterns in the chaos. Um, and so just like that meditation of looking for pattern in the chaos, whether that be uh, through your spiritual practice or whether that be um, through, uh, you know, processing your own trauma or your own memories, like I think we all have a different lens into that. And I find that really fascinating. Um, a lot of times this was uh, in Beauty and the Herding, it's a lot about this idea of wolves and sheep and how wolves chase sheep and how sheep run away, but that how sheep left to their own devices kind of flock together and they move in, in individually creative ways, but also collectively creative ways. Um, and I, I just find that really beautiful. And so when I went to uh, Flora, Fauna and False Gods, I was looking at, okay, if at a high level, like a global level, you were to watch all these creatures move around the earth and what patterns would their lives make? 
um, what I wanted to do with Flora, Fauna, False Gods, and Floods is zoom in. Like, what are they making? Like, what are their individual lives look like? Uh, what are they drawing that inspires them? And so I was thinking about us as humans, like, what do we draw? Well, we draw idols. <laughs> like, we have our gods, right? And we come up with lots of them. Um, and there's kind of no telling what the real ones are and what the fake ones were, except for time, right? Um, we also have, we also love beauty and nature. We, um, we draw, you know, insect, we are infinitely amazed by the intricacies of insects and, and birds and plants and all of these things. So what would happen if all of these voids worked together to draw something that they found beautiful? And then what would happen? I'm going to refresh this to a new one. What would happen if, um, you know, the, the forces of nature, I'll call them floods, were to like move these voids um, involuntarily? Like how would that affect what they draw? And so that was just kind of a meditation on like, hey, like um, we all draw, make these beautiful things while we're alive, but we're, we're like moved by forces beyond our control. Um, and so in that way, as I zoomed in on all these pieces, you'll see that rather than uh, chasing or running away from each other, they often dance around each other. So a lot of the movement in Flora, Fauna, and False Gods is about like moving in relation to each other, like dancing together, and what kind of beautiful things you can make as a collective and where it kind of goes wrong. Um, and so with, with um, Colors That Heal, it was kind of uh, went back to this like, if these creatures were looking to, to um, like intersect and branch and grow off each other and create these like more organic structures like cellular automata or or, um, or like trees and plants and how they grow and branch and interact with each other, um, you know, like what does that represent? Does it represent like beauty or does it represent disease? Um, and uh, so yeah, like that's that's kind of the headspace I'm in. Like nothing I've done in the past ten years hasn't been touched by my journey with my son. And so it kind of feeds into my art practice, whether it be like really representational, like that dragon cancer, or whether it be really abstract, like what I'm doing with art blocks. I remember the first time uh, seeing an output from Flora Fauna and I can't remember which, uh, which like palette it was, but I, I almost felt, <laughs> I almost felt wrong. I was like watching like an organism growing and like and being mm -hmm. created um mm -hmm. and i think that's like the beauty of uh, creating um these with such an organic feel is they're as you said like very emotive um mm -hmm. and I, I think all of your projects so far um are um, we have a question from um fat packs x and his question is have you ever thought about making a game project on our box <laughs> yes absolutely um I'm even contemplating that now, but it comes with different constraints. Like a lot of the rules of art blocks are that it needs to live on chain, uh, which means that like file storage comes at a premium, right? Like storing things on chain is very expensive. So you need to be very conscious about the size of script that you're putting in an art blocks project. Um, and, uh, and then you sort of like render at whatever size you, uh, you want. So when you think about games, like, Games are, are nice for interaction, but ultimately what an art blocks collector wants is a piece that they can also display. And so it's that balance of like um, the journey of the player or the journey of the viewer or the collector and and where they where they land. And so I feel like a lot of what I've been exploring in these first three projects will lead me to kind of that answer of like making that game that... Um, making that game that the journey is the art. Um, and that's what, uh, that's something like I'm working on right now. So I'm really excited about that space. And I, I think it's one place where art blocks can really, like where we can innovate on art blocks in, in the general web three space, because I think we've been kind of seeking different goals. Like we're either like maximizing attention and trying to get users or maximizing value um, and uh, and thinking about things like play to earn um, and and those kind of like game mechanics where we're thinking out of from like an economic perspective. And I'd really like to think about it from a narrative perspective. Like mm -hmm. 
what are what does the movement of you through a space or NPCs through a space say about the the composition as a whole? Like, and what can you like? What stories can you tell individually as well as collectively by interacting with art? So that's that's like definitely where my heart is, and so I'm glad that that interests you. Awesome. No, I, I, definitely looking forward to that. Um, and I, I think you're, you have a great thinking there too. I, like so many of the, the games so far that have been, you know, uh, attached to crypto, Web3, have really been um, financial, financially, you know, motivated or incentivized. Mm -hmm. um, when at the end of the day, I, I literally had a tweet the other day, like saying, I, like, I miss when games were just like pure fun, right? It was yeah. less about like the dopamine uh, hamster wheel and more about just like, playing some games with your mates um, yeah like going a place that you've never been before yeah like just that journey of exploration and that's what i love about generative art is that it's always even a practice for me of discovery so like i want to bring that feeling of discovery for collectors into into new pieces amazing so we're coming up on the top of the hour i did want to just give you an opportunity if there's anything else you wanted to share about the project uh, the charity component um uh, I know there's uh, there was some one on ones auctioned. Uh, anything you wanted to touch on before we close, Ryan? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, yeah, like the the project is still open. Um, excuse me. Once we once we mint out, there's a collection of um, five mints um, at the top of the project. There are mints one through five, and um, we're going to auction those uh, off as kind of like a a way to generate more revenue for Sustento. Um, and so I'm excited about that. That one has like a flex engine element where um, there is a word that lives in the metadata and I've incorporated that, <laughs> excuse me, word kind of naturally into the composition. If we were to take that word away, it would still render, it would just render slightly differently. Um, and so uh, that's, I think, uh, really interesting. Also endowment, um, started this flex plat powered platform because they really want to, you know, encourage artists and uh, nonprofit uh, more direct collaborations. And so um, by putting it on the flex platform, that opens up a lot of opportunity for innovation in the art space, uh, as well as like more direct, like a lot of times, a lot of artists on art blocks, they, donate to charities, which is wonderful. This is an opportunity to work like directly with a charity mm -hmm. to consider like what their goals are, what they want to talk about, how to represent what they're doing directly in, in your art. And so I think it, I think it's just a space for, um, for artists and, and nonprofit collaborations to grow. And um, I think that's really cool. And so by, you know, if we mint out this project, that will kind of signal to endowment, like they can keep going and, and keep growing. So, um, so yeah, by, by minting, you also encourage not only, you know, uh, donations to Sustento, but also the opportunity to grow a platform on endowment that focuses like, that focuses on charities and how we can um, work as a community to like really uh, expand their reach and their impact. Definitely. And it's also very cool that uh, your project is technically project number zero. On, yeah. On their, on their platform. So, yeah, I thought that awesome. was really cool. So, again, Ryan, thank you so much uh, for speaking on the project today. Um, I think, like I said, it'll be very rewarding for the, uh, those who watch and those who be like listening in the future. Um, and uh, thank you for everyone who watched today and we'll, we'll be watching in the future. Till then, uh, be great and happy minting. Thanks all.